Hi, my name is Avril Sorter and you're listening to Conducting Cisco Unified Wireless Site Survey. In this lesson, we're going to talk about how you prepare yourself before going out and doing the site survey. There's nothing worse than arriving at your customer site and not being prepared, not having all the information that you need to have in order to do the site survey, or potentially not having all the tools that you need to do that site survey. Sometimes if you're not prepared, what happens is it will force you perhaps to come back at a later date. You can really lose a lot of credibility that way. So in this lesson, we're first going to go through the information that you'd want to have prior to going out and doing a site survey. We're also going to take a look at the Cisco 802.11n access point product family and some of the key features for those different access points. Once we've done that, we're actually going to touch a little bit on predictive plans as well. And what is the purpose of a predictive plan as part of your preparing to do a site survey? Once we've done that, we're going to take a look at the site survey equipment. And one of the things you're going to do as a site surveyor is to have a toolkit with all of the equipment that you need to do your survey. And that equipment list may vary a little bit depending on whether you're doing an indoor and outdoor survey or there may be other factors that come into play where you'll take some tools on one site survey and a different set of tools on a different site survey. But we're going to go through the most common set of tools that one would use. There's also a range of different tools that you might want to use to determine what's happening in the RF spectrum so that you can better predict and plan out how the wireless network should be deployed. And in this lesson, we're going to take a look at some of those tools. And then we'll finish up this lesson by looking at some best practices that you'll want to follow when you're preparing to do a site survey. So let's first talk about the information that you need to put together to help you understand doing the site survey. And this is the information you also want to take out with you when you're conducting the site survey. So the first thing you want to do is you want to have your work or your job order in front of you. So that would have some sort of reference number. It'll give you the customer name, the location, and very typically, it also includes some sort of expectation of when this job will be done. And so have some sort of implementation schedule that you'll be requested to follow. In addition, there may be a customer purchase order. And typically, before you go out on any job order, you do want to make sure that the purchase order has been done and is approved so that the work can be effectively billed for. You then want to put together all of the survey forms that you asked your customer to put together. And on there, you should see the customer contact information, the person that you should call when you arrive on site. In addition, you want to bring any blueprints or site plans or network plans, anything that you've been given that will indicate exactly where you're being asked to do the site survey on. So one of the other documents that's very common to see is something called the Statement of Work or simply the SOW. The exact contents of the SOW can vary quite a lot. Sometimes it can be very detailed and articulate everything in the project from the scope to the deliverables to the timeline and it can lay it all out exactly what needs to be delivered. Other times it can be fairly brief and just list the key deliverables and the key dates. The thing to note about an SOW is that it is a binding agreement between the company that you're representing doing the survey and the company that you're doing the survey for. And so it's normally a description of the work and you'll be contractually obliged to deliver what's defined in the SOW. So if there is an SOW, and generally there is, 
do make sure that you get hold of that and make sure you're very clear on exactly what the deliverables and the timelines of those deliverables are. Now, one of the golden rules of doing a site survey is that you do the site survey using the access point and equipment that you plan to actually deploy in a live scenario. So before you go out, you need to look at the customer information that was filled in on the pre-survey forms and ask yourself what kind of access points is appropriate for this environment. So some of the things you might want to consider is the price point versus the functionality. Some of the higher end Cisco access points have more capability and functionality, but they are more expensive. So you need to make a call as to what is the best access point for this specific customer's requirements. You should look at whether you need to deploy a single or a dual band access point. The dual band you might be using as mesh or bridge links on one spectrum and then normal client coverage on the other spectrum. You may be, for instance, recommending that you keep legacy on one band and put all new 802.11n equipment on a different band. So look to see if you're going to be deploying a single or a dual mode access point because if you're deploying a dual mode access point, you'll need to do the site survey looking at both the 2.4 and the 5 gigahertz band. What kind of antennas are you planning to use indoors, outdoors, or internal or external as we often refer to them? So what kind of antennas do you want to take out with you? I always carry a few antennas, even if I'm going out to an office environment, perhaps a wall, an anomaly, and a corner antenna just gives you an ability to actually see coverage in using different antenna options. So take out some different antennas with you. Is this a site that would want to be using beamforming? Beamforming is not available on all access points. And beamforming is when I form a narrow beam in order to get more range in terms of coverage from the access point to where the client might be. And I might want to use beamforming, for instance, to cover areas like stairwells or just areas where I'm having trouble getting coverage and, um, and I don't want to deploy another access point. Did the client specify any requirements to have a ruggedized access point? Does it need any external housing? Always ask that question if you're dealing in places like warehousing and manufacturing where you might find a lot of dust particles in the air. You might want to find out whether it does need that external housing. Also, if it's outside, you know, what are the weather conditions? Is it going to suffer rain and fog and snow, etc.? Will they require features like auto RF? Auto RF is dynamic channel assignment. So in the 5 gigahertz band, it'll automatically select a channel that's got less noise and interference in it. Are they looking for an access point that also has intrusion detection and prevention mechanisms? And are there other capabilities that they want that would make you think that a controller-based solution is better for the deployment as opposed to having the access points in an autonomous mode? An example would be if there was a very large deployment of 10 and upwards access points, you'd probably recommend you want a controller-based solution. Now, in addition to gathering all the information, a couple of things you need to bear in mind before you head out. You need to arrange a date and a time that you're actually be going out to the customer site to do the site survey. And it may be one day or if it's a larger site, you may need to do that over several days. But you need to arrange the times and the dates with your customer ahead of time. Make sure that you've got access to all of the areas that they want to have covered. It's not unusual for them to say, I can give you coverage in this area, but I can't let you into this area here during these hours. And of course, you can't complete the site survey unless you've looked at all of the areas. You can't make any assumptions about, oh, because I've analyzed floor one, I can take those assumptions and apply them to floor two. So you have to do a site survey for all the areas that they want to have covered.
It is also a really good idea to make sure that the IT and the facility staff are available to help you should you come up with any questions or things that you need clarified. So personally, before I go out to a site survey, I pull the technical specs off the access point and also the devices that the user has told me they expect to connect to those access points. And on these access points and device specifications, look at the receiver sensitivity, look at the transmit power levels. And I think you'll find that very, very valuable for when you actually sit down and do your site survey and you're trying to work out what should be the transmit power for my access point and what are the different power levels on my client. When we look at Cisco's 80211 access points, which are focused on the enterprise market, they define them into three categories. The first category, business ready, this is an entry level access point, normally focused on small to mid-sized businesses, so smaller deployments. And there's two models there, the 600 and the 1040. The next one is the interactive multimedia. And this is looking at deployments which are more in the size of medium to large. The main thing here is that they're looking at services such as voice, video, location tracking. And the two models there are the 1140 series and the 1260 series. And the final category that Cisco defined for their enterprise level access points is the mission critical. Now, mission critical access points include the Cisco Clean Air technology. And this is all about making sure that you operate on the best RF channel possible. And so it collects information, allows you to analyze it so that you can then make the best decision about the channels and how you deploy those access points. Now, the mission critical also supports all the functionality that you saw in the interactive multimedia. So you can use them for voice and video and location tracking applications as well. Now, in that grouping, you will see the 3500 series and also the 3600 series. Now, if you're looking for an outside access point, then you would look at the 1550 series. So to provide you with a little bit more information about these access points, in the business ready, I mentioned the 600 and the 1040. The 600 is really great for someone who's like working from home, telecommuting into the office. It has the ability to set up a secure tunnel um, and supports many of the security features, but is not really for a deployment in an office because it doesn't support things like power of Ethernet. It doesn't do the wireless intrusion but prevention system, the WIPS technology. The 1040 is still in the business ready category. It's a little bit stronger in terms of the issues like mobility, self-healing when there's dead spots or you need to maintain the connection. So it's better for kind of like roaming multiple access point deployments. Now, the rich media, as I mentioned, were for voice, video and location tracking. And so they really support applications which are more sensitive to latency. So the main difference between the 1140 and the 1260 you can see over here on the pictures is that the 1240 supports an external antenna. So you can mix and match these in a deployment. Like for instance, you might use the 1140 with inside the building and then maybe on the walls or in the corners or areas where you have more difficult coverage issue and you want to use external antennas, then you can deploy the 1260. So you'll notice that the 3500 and the 3600 both come with an option to do internal antennas or external antennas. Now you'll notice here on the 3500, I have three antennas for deployment in the 2.4 gigahertz band and three antennas for deployment in the 5 gigahertz band. So it's a three by three MIMO solution. 
when you look at the 3600 you'll notice i've got four antennas and this is the first four by four mimos 